So I'm going to talk through nutrition in generally in relation to NETS, but there's also a few specific areas in terms of symptom management that Kate's flagged as areas of interest amongst patients. So um, I'm going to focus on that a little bit as well, such as diarrhoea, microbiome and those sorts of things. But I guess in general, it's always good to come back to what the overall goals of nutrition is for someone with a neuroendocrine tumour. And a lot of these goals are probably quite common to people with cancer as well. Um, so certainly you want to minimise any weight loss and overall improve nutritional status. So, you know, if weight control is an issue for you, um, we certainly don't want people gaining excessive amounts of weight. We also don't want people losing weight. So maintaining a healthy weight is most important. I think one of the most important things that nutrition can help people with is quality of life. So, you know, eating is not just about the nutrients that you're putting into your body. It's also about um, social activity and how you feel, um, what you enjoy. So food's meant to be enjoyable as well. So there's so many different aspects of food. And when people have difficulty with eating and drinking, it can cause difficulties in all those different aspects of eating. So that's really important. Um, so response and recovery from treatment. So there's a lot of good evidence that with any cancer treatment, nutrition and optimised nutrition and keeping a healthy weight and not being malnourished really puts you at the best chance of responding to treatment the best you can, but also recovering as quickly as possible. And a lot of that has to do with the um, immune function response that you get from really good nutrition in the body. Symptom management. So there's a lot to be said about nutrition and managing symptoms. So symptoms can impact how you eat. So therefore, nutrition has a way to modify what you eat to aid in symptom management, as well as foods that you eat may exacerbate symptoms. So it's thinking about that sort of relationship as well. Um, I'll talk a little bit about vitamin malabsorption and what deficiencies are worth noting um, when you've got a neuroendocrine tumour. Also, just to point out the role in what we call multidisciplinary care. So I guess that's, that's the combined care that you get from your doctor, your nurse, and allied health, which includes a dietitian. Um, and other sort of health professionals along the way. What we do um, is very much a team effort and I think having input from all those different roles is really important. So I've talked a bit about some of the general principles but maintaining a healthy weight, um, which if you're under 65 is a body mass index between 20 and 25 or if you're over 65 the range is a little bit higher. Um, and hopefully most people know how to calculate their BMI so that's dividing your weight um, by metres squared for your height. So a high protein diet is really good for people that have issues putting on weight um, and a high energy high protein diet is good in that general sense, particularly if you're undergoing a treatment that might be increasing your energy needs such as chemotherapy or radiation or if you're post-surgery often a high protein diet, high energy diet is quite beneficial. Eat frequently and don't skip meals. So if you start skipping meals and eating less, that's when you can sort of not get enough vitamins and nutrients in your body. Um, generally, and these are just as per the healthy guidelines for Australia, which is eat a variety of foods every day, have a big range of food groups, and I'll talk a bit about that in terms of the vitamins, but focusing on lots of different fruits, vegetables, um, whole grains, um, lean meats and dairy, if you get a really good range of all those food groups um, over your diet, you'll make sure that you're getting as much nutrition as possible and a range of all your vitamins as well. Some of you were on healthier foods, things like salt saturated fat and sugar, obviously avoid if you can. But if you're feeling well um, and you're not losing weight but your weight's pretty healthy and you don't have a problem with that, still follow the principles of healthy eating um, but you don't have to worry too much about following any particular diets. So just talking about carcinoid syndrome and I'm not sure if anyone in the room is suffering that at the moment um, but some nets that cause a lot of production of serotonin which is a particular hormone um, from the cancer cells that are affected can lead to really significant symptoms like flushing, diarrhoea, um, abdominal pain, fatigue, wheezing um, and it can become quite debilitating having these symptoms um, but there are some nutrition links that are thought to be um, related to the serotonin producing nets and people with Parkinson's syndrome. One flag is that there's a relationship between serotonin production and also the synthesis or production of tryptophan, which is an essential amino acid that our body produces but also gets from food. Um, normally, to synthesise tryptophan, um, you have sort of a small amount of serotonin, about sort of 1% is, is synthesised into serotonin in a normal person without a net. Um, but if you have a neuroendocrine tumour, sometimes that overproduction of serotonin actually reduces that production of tryptophan. It kind of changes the pathway of production. 
And if tryptophan's low, that in turn actually leads to um, deficiency of vitamin B3, which is niacin. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that when I talk about vitamin deficiency. The other thing to mention is some food and drinks can, what we call trigger, and you might hear of the terms of like trigger foods, um, but we don't have really clear evidence on these. And a lot of it's very anecdotal, meaning that people are reporting that there's certain foods and drinks that make them feel worse or make their diarrhoea worse, make their flushing worse, which are worth noting. And I've got a bit of information on them here, but I really want to point out that it's quite individual in nature. So just because someone finds, and I've had patients say to me, you know, I can't have avocado, I can't have banana, which is some of the foods moderate to high in amines listed down the bottom. But that doesn't mean that everybody with carcinoid syndrome or with a net will have a problem with banana or avocado. It is very individual. Um, the reason these foods down the bottom are listed as potential risk foods it is because they already contain natural forms of amines, which is another kind of um, hormonal product that, I guess, has similar effects in the body as serotonin does. So if you've already got an overproduction of serotonin, the additional impact of the amines can sometimes exacerbate your symptoms. So they're things to be aware of that might be a problem for you, but what I would suggest is doing a food and symptom diary as the very first strategy if you're finding that you are getting exacerbation of symptoms with any foods, um, doing a diary for a minimum of two weeks, so you essentially record down everything you eat from morning to night, everything you drink from morning to night, and then any symptoms you're experiencing, how severe they are um, over the, that period of time as well. There is a food and symptom diary available on the Unicorn Foundation website. Um, it's really useful to download. Some general triggers that people probably report as more commonly leading to worse symptoms. So if someone's got carcinoid syndrome, as a dietitian, I would say to them, think about things like meal size, think about fat content, think about the spiciness of the food that you're eating, and also have a think about your alcohol intake as well. So those four things, meal size, fat content, spice, food, and alcohol are probably the key things that we see more commonly related to worsening of symptoms in carcinoid syndrome. And then the, these food types, high in amines, are sort of a sometimes effect. So a bit about diarrhoea, which can be really multifactorial. There's many reasons someone can have diarrhoea. Um, there's reasons that you can have it related to your net. So it could be due to the hormonal production of the net that's causing diarrhoea in the body. It could be because you've had surgery and your gut's not functioning or absorbing nutrients as well. It could be because of a certain intolerance to something, um, a function of your gut's been modified, or you've had an infection or treatment to the bowel. It's important to check for the cause first, and if you've got diarrhea and you're not quite sure why or it's new, definitely check with your doctor immediately. Um, the cause will determine what the treatment is, and I'll talk about a few of those things. Eat little and often, so normally if you eat a lot in one go or you have really large meals, that can often make your diarrhoea worse. Um, so eating small amounts and more frequently is much better. In general, if you've got diarrhoea and your gut is a bit inflamed, it's better to avoid foods that naturally go undigested throughout the gut, so that's your really insoluble fibres, so things that are visibly really grainy or seedy um, or that you kind of look at and go, that would be quite a lot harder to digest. So. Um, seeded bread or um, things with husks in them, um, like apple skin, that sort of stuff. Um, the things with soluble fibres, so these are fibres that are partially digested, so oats and the fruit with the skin and seeds removed, um, those sorts of things are absolutely fine to continue having. So one type of diarrhoea we call steatorrhea. Um, and when you hear the term steatorrhea, that refers to a a stool that's really foul smelling, it might be floating, it might be pale, it could be foaming in the bowl, it could be hard to flush, so it sort of sits there and you've got to flush two or three times. The reason that that is that way is because it's probably indicating that you're actually passing a lot of fat through your stool and that's the reason why <coughs> it might be pale or it might be floating. This often indicates fat malabsorption, so majority of the fat that you eat is absorbed into your gut or it's sort of stored in the body. If you're passing a lot of it out in your stools, it probably means that your body's digestion process is not working appropriately. And how it's treated is that you get pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy. So there's pancreatic enzymes called lipases, 
that get released that actually aid in that digestion and absorption of fats in the small bowel. Um, if they're not working properly, which could be due to your pancreas not working properly, um, we've had bowel surgery, um, that can mean that your fat's been malabsorbed. Also vitamin malabsorption, and I'll talk a bit about that um, at a later stage, but fat-soluble vitamins are at risk of deficiency if you're having problems with um, steatorrhea. Think about lactose intolerance. So sometimes people have got an underlying lactose intolerance, not to say you shouldn't have any dairy or dairy-related products if you have diarrhoea. And one of the worst things someone can do is just cut out dairy without thinking about if they've actually got an intolerance because dairy is, you know, a nutritious food. It's high in protein and calcium. But sometimes it can be related to a lactose intolerance. So just something to think about if you do get your symptoms exacerbated by having dairy. I'll talk a bit about the microbiome um, at the end, but probiotics in some people may help. It's not a guarantee, but taking um, good bacteria through the form of, you know, yogurts or your cults and those other sort of products might be helpful to sort of control any harmful bacteria that's in the gut. So if you think you've got, um, so small intestinal bacterial overgrowth is another cause that I haven't mentioned already and some people get that after surgery and some people with nets are prone to getting that. Um, so that's when you've got an overgrowth of bad bacteria in the gut and that can cause all sorts of inflammation and problems with tolerance um, and diarrhea. So sometimes having some probiotics can sort of balance that out a little bit but the evidence is not 100% clear if that's a long-term option for people that are suffering that. So vitamins and electrolytes are important, particularly in terms of a loss point of view. So if you're losing through diarrhoea a lot of fluid, you're probably losing a lot of electrolytes as well. So sometimes if you've got bad diarrhoea, you're taking electrolyte replacement um, drinks and that sort of thing, like hydrolyte, gastrolyte, is quite a good idea. So a bit more about fat malabsorption. I just wanted to mention somatostatin analogues. So that's the hormone treatment that a lot of NET patients are on. Is anyone in the room here on injections? Yeah. So in somatostatin analog injections, not in everybody, but in some people can actually cause pancreatic insufficiency. And the reason behind that is because whilst the injection is there to reduce the hormone production from the tumour, it actually inadvertently reduces hormone production overall in some people. So as a result, if your effectiveness of your pancreas is not as good as normal, you might get reduced effectiveness of lipases and of other hormones and enzymes released that are there for normal digestion. Mm -hmm. And therefore you might get sort of malabsorption, diarrhea, um, fat malabsorption and steatorrhea as a result. So there is some talk that people that are on long-term somatostatin analog therapy may be at risk of fat-soluble vitamin deficiencies and that they're worth thinking about. And potentially if you've got ongoing diarrhea, particularly if you're having injections, talk to your doctor about the diarrhea and maybe ask if you need to take some pancreatic enzymes to help that. Most importantly, um, don't avoid fat if you have got diarrhea or if you think that you have got fat malabsorption. Fat is a really good source of energy. It's a good source of fat-soluble vitamins. So the best thing to do is to try and absorb the fat appropriately through pancreatic enzymes and not actually avoid eating fat. It's easy for people to say, oh, I just won't eat high-fat food or anything containing fat, but that's a really good source of energy that we need. So pancreatic enzymes, a little bit about these. So Creon is probably the most common brand used, um, but there are other brands around. Um, PERT is another term they use, P-E-R-T, which is pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy. So these are essentially tablets or little capsules um, that are taken at a meal time. So it's really important that you take them if you are prescribed them as soon as you start eating. The effectiveness is about 20 minutes, so that there is the digestive aid. Um, if you take them half an hour before a meal, they would have finished their action before you started eating. So take them as soon as you start eating. Um, and they're prescribed in 10 or 25,000 unit tablets. And you get told how many of those to take at a meal. And some people have to take them at a snack as well. In terms of dietary sources of fat soluble vitamins, because people do ask, you know, if I'm malabsorbing fat and I might be low in these, if I just eat more of the foods that contain them, is that effective? And the answer is usually not, because you've got a mechanism in your gut where you're not digesting and absorbing food appropriately. You can eat as much as you like, but that issue with absorption is still going to be there. So your best method is to talk to your doctor about taking maybe pancreatic enzymes to see if that will help, help for you. Probably something else to note, if you're also taking um, protein pump inhibitors, so um, 
heartburn medication like omeprazole, pantoprazole, those sorts of things, take them before you take the crayon because it can only sort of inhibit the action a little bit. So check with your doctor if you are taking both. So just to highlight probably some of the vitamins that are key to think about when you have a net. Not to say everybody's at risk of these vitamin deficiencies, but they're just ones to be aware of. Um, I've listed some of the key ones and I've already talked about a couple. So if we start with the fat soluble vitamins, that's vitamin A, E, D and K. The reasons why you might be low in those, so I've talked about the pancreatic insufficiency. So if you've got bad diarrhea or if you've got steatorrhea or if you've gone long-term somatostatin analogues that might lead to pancreatic insufficiency, that could put you at risk. In terms of testing, we don't really routinely test vitamin A, E or K. Um, and as a dietitian, I probably wouldn't normally record that. What I'd normally say to someone if they were reporting diarrhoea, um, I'd say to them, let's get you on some crayon and see if that actually improves your symptoms. And in turn, if it does, that will then certainly help um, absorb your fat-soluble vitamins. Vitamin D is a blood test that is done quite routinely, and that's a very quick turnaround. Um, so that's one we can test easily. Um, deficiency, what does that actually mean? So various different deficiency problems will occur depending which vitamin you're low in. Um, and the treatment obviously is crayon or PERT, as I mentioned. So B12 um, is contained mostly in meat and dairy products. So if you're someone who's got quite a low meat intake, um, so vegetarians included, um, or if someone who's had stomach or bowel surgery, particularly small bowel surgery, um, you may be at risk of vitamin B12 deficiency. Um, it's very easily tested through a blood test that only takes a couple of days to return. Um, and doctors do sometimes request it. If you're low in B12, it can have problems for anemia um, and fatigue. So it's quite important that it is replaced and at normal levels. You can take it orally or you can have an injection. If you've had surgery, you probably will be recommended an injection because that's a more efficient way to get enough B12 into your body. So I've mentioned niacin, which is vitamin B3. So that's those serotonin producing nets or people suffering carcinoid syndrome. Not everybody will necessarily be at risk of B3 deficiency, and I'll talk about the stats from the research in a minute, but um, if you are someone who's had carcinoid syndrome quite badly for a long period of time, it's worth thinking about asking your doctor about it and the risks of it, and testing is possible. I'm doing some testing of it as part of my PhD, but it's not actually a logistically great test to do. It's a 24-hour urine collection, so it's quite laborious compared to just doing a quick blood test. Um, and it's actually not routine. There's only one testing centre in Australia that actually analyses urine tests for niacin. So as a test, it's not routine, but people are sometimes told to take niacin tablets as a bit of a preventative measure. So you may be at risk of deficiency, take some niacin, roughly 25 to 50 micrograms twice a day, just to cover you for that. The really good thing about B12, niacin, is that they're water-soluble vitamins. So you actually excrete what you don't need. So if you're taking a supplement, well, it's not great to overdose and take too much, that sort of amount, if your body's actually got enough, you'll end up just paying it out anyway. So it's usually pretty safe. Can I just ask you, sorry, yeah. one question. So taking niacin orally, would that help prevent pellagra? You know how when you go on Google, you can't help it. You go on Google, like yeah. the effects of pellagra. I know, it looks quite nasty, doesn't it? It's horrible. Yeah. Which is the yes. one. No, they all do diarrhea. Yeah. It's, it's dementia, diarrhea, and death in three days, <laughs> which it's sound, horrible. yes, really horrible and I terrifying. Think it's been a real topic yeah. of conversation okay. in our Facebook group. Yeah. I know yeah. there are people in this room who've watched those conversations. Yeah. So yeah. There's been um, a number of people who have discovered that they've had pellagra, and yeah, so it's okay. been quite a hot topic. So this is yeah. great that you're covering it. Yeah, and I've got a slide, I think it's after this is the next one, that's got a couple of the stats of what how what percent of the population might have it. Um, but, um, yeah, look, it's a scary thing because you hear about these horrible symptoms, and but probably the existence of um, overt clinical pellagra is very low. Um, I know most of the health professionals I work with have never seen it in their practice. I think... The reality is a lot of people are potentially biochemically deficient. So if you did a test, they'd come up as low, but they wouldn't necessarily be presenting <coughs> with pellagra. So sort of having that dermatitis and pigmentation change and that sort of thing. 
Um, <coughs> so, but look, it's something that certainly, if you're someone who's, you know, really for a long period of time been suffering bad cast mode syndrome, it's definitely worthwhile thinking about taking a B vitamin um, or niacin specifically and asking about it because you want to be safe, mm -hmm. um, make sure that you're covering yourself. Um, that pellagra itself, you know, the confusion, um, the cognition changes and the dermatitis is not seen that commonly here. It's quite, B3 deficiency on a whole is a very rare deficiency in the general population. You only really see it in um, sort of non-westernised countries and that sort of thing due to severe malnutrition. Um, in terms of, I'll come back to the iron, but in terms of, if I go here to this slide, um, some of the stats. So two studies have been published, one in 05 and one in 2016, looking at small groups of patients with a serotonin producing net and carcinoid syndrome and between about 28 to 45 percent of that group were what they call biochemical deficient so that's they did a test they didn't feel any different but they did a test and they were low on a test so they then treated that but in terms of clinical niacin deficiencies so existence of what they diagnose as pellagra there's been one study in the 70s and another I think more in the 2000s but it's as low as five percent or less so it's a lot, lot less common. So in terms of iron, so that's another one that's probably more common. So again, low meat intake. If you've had bowel surgery, quite common to be deficient in that. And if you have any blood loss as well, or sort of um, blood in your stools and that sort of thing. Um, easily tested through a blood test. Anemia is the problem that occurs when you're low um, and you get iron orally or in a transfusion. It's quite easy to take orally. If there's any problems with your absorption, you might be suggested to have a transfusion. So in terms of the fat soluble vitamins, I've already talked about some of the risks of deficiency, um, but I just wanted to mention some of the data um, that I've found in the literature, which, look, there isn't much. I've got three studies listed here, and that's three studies that all done in the last 20 years, um, but looking at prevalence of these deficiencies. So one actually reported up to 80% of patients with a net um, maybe deficient at least one fat soluble vitamin, so that would have been one of A, D, E or K. Um, but not all the people in this study were necessarily symptomatic, so having diarrhoea, not all of them were necessarily on creon or pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy. Um, so it's just something to be aware of that we might need to think about asking a little bit more about. Vitamin D deficiency is seen as prevalent but something also worth noting is the general population, it's prevalent anyway. Vitamin D not only has a connection to um, you know, fat malabsorption, but also if you're not getting adequate sunlight, conversion of the active form of vitamin D comes through ultraviolet radiation. Um, if you're not getting enough sunlight, if you're very fair skinned, um, certain ethnicities are more at risk. So that tends to happen anyway, regardless of whether you've got a net or not. And generally, we're limited in data for fat-soluble vitamins because they're not really a routine test, like I said, that we do. And I've sort of already talked about niacin. I think something, too, worth noting is this, the research they've looked into for niacin, even though we've got some data on it, it's all very cross-sectional. Cross-sectional meaning they're just measuring people at one point in time. What we don't know is if that niacin levels are decreasing over time, particularly people that are starting a somatostatin analogue and then taking it over longer periods of time. So there's a bit more to be done, I think, in terms of researching that. So in terms of the gut microbiome, so what does it really mean? I guess it means all the microorganisms that exist in your gut. Um, so that could be bacteria, fungi and viruses that sit in there and they're there to do their normal functions. Um, they're there to aid in gut function, they break down nutrients, they help with digestion, um, they help immune function, and they prevent colonisation by bad bacteria. So by the good bacteria being there, there's less chance that the bad, nasty, infectious bacteria will get in. There's a problem with your microbiome when you get overgrowth of a particular kind of organism, or if a lot of bad bacteria actually gets into your gut, if maybe for whatever reason you get death and reduction in the numbers of your good bacteria. And that can come through different treatments or being unwell. There has been some research into the connection between how your microbiome is behaving and certain diseases. There's no definitive connections between the two. There's just been some general associations that have been found so you know, that people with certain statuses of microbiome might be more likely to respond to certain chemotherapies and that sort of thing. But it's very much early research and nothing that's definitive at the moment. 
Sorry? Um, potentially, but probably what's not been set in stone is how that will help you, I suppose. I mean, there's people doing a lot of research into that, so there's people that are doing studies where they're testing microbiomes and seeing if people respond differently to different treatments and things, but to suggest to the general population they should be testing is probably not clear at the moment. It's sort of early days in terms of research. And I think, too, you'd have to think about where you'd get your testing as well. I mean, there's a lot of research studies that are happening, but um, same with probiotics, which I'll talk about too, but the probiotics available at the moment, they vary a lot in terms of their um, <coughs> content. And there's some researchers that are indicating that you may not necessarily get benefit from them unless they're designed specifically to deal with the situation of your microbiome. So there's a lot about sort of it, testing of someone's microbiome, you know, individualised treatment of that and that sort of thing. Um, so, yeah, I mean, so I can say that there's potential benefits of it, but if we're looking at the literature as it, as it stands at the moment, it's not 100% clear cut. Um, so prebiotics are substances such as different fibres that actually help the microbes in the gut live and thrive. Um, there's some natural sources of these, and I've listed a few of them off. So there's certain things that, you know, if you eat them, they've got these natural fibres that actually help your gut. Um, whereas probiotics are actually ingesting sort of healthy, good bacteria to try and balance out um, that environment in your gut. So common ones like lactobacillus, which you can get in a lot of yogurts, um, in a health class you call those sorts of products, um, and other tablets. And sometimes they're beneficial if you're taking antibiotics or if you've got irritable bowel syndrome, if you've had major surgery, if you've got ongoing diarrhoea, you might be someone who's got an imbalance of your bacteria in your gut, so taking probiotics could be quite effective in those scenarios. For just someone who otherwise feels well with none of these situations and are feeling healthy, not sure if it'll really help, but it shouldn't hurt to take them if you're really keen to do so. Um, they may be beneficial in combination as well, I guess, so prebiotics and probiotics together um, could be helpful and have a combined response, which is worth knowing. Um, but like I said before, the research is really emerging and there's no sort of clear-cut recommendations at this stage. Is yep. chicory root known by another name? Because I'm familiar with chicory, which is a great yeah. vegetable, yeah. but I've never seen a chicory root. Yeah, well, it must just be the root of that vegetable, I suppose. Yeah, that must contain more of the fibrous okay. material than the leaves, which the leaves would still have fibre in them, but um, it's particular sort of fibres and substances that these foods contain. And that's just a short list of some, but doesn't even, that's not an exhaustive list, but yeah. Can I ask a question, yeah. Erin, if someone's got um, a lot of carcinoid syndrome and they're on the somatostatin analogs mm. and, and they're still getting carcinoid syndrome breaking through, they're getting a lot of diarrhoea, would that logically deplete the microbiome because they're getting so much diarrhoea and therefore maybe yeah. it might be good to supplement? Yeah. yeah, definitely potentially. Uh, people that have quite severe diarrhoea are probably one group that could benefit from probiotics. Absolutely, because I think when you've got inflammation of the gut, you're malabsorbing a lot of nutrition. Um, you, your bacteria and your, your microbes in the gut are not functioning properly either because everything's passing through. So, yeah, absolutely. It could potentially aid in some digestion. It doesn't say it's going to fix the diarrhoea necessarily, but it could sort of help balance out. So people that we normally suggest it for would be people with chronic diarrhoea um, and people with um, general sort of intolerances and sort of gut um, inactivity and that sort of thing. One thing to be aware of if you're on anything that might be immune compromising, so chemotherapy for example, probiotics are suggested not to take at all because it can be a bit of a risk if you're immune compromised. But yeah, if you're someone with severe diarrhea, that's the type of person that we would suggest to take it. Yeah. Um, okay, so this is a bit of a wordy slide, but I thought I'd finish off by talking a bit about what my PhD involves. Um, so the short title is Nutrition in Nets um, and the, really the aim is to determine the impact of, so get nets meaning gastroenteropancreatic, it's a bit of a mouthful, some people might have heard that term, it's essentially gastrointestinal nets and their treatment on patients' nutritional status and health related quality of life. We're really hoping that 
through this data collection and research we'll be able to inform some screening guidelines around screening people who are at risk of nutrition issues and also sort of leading to some nutrition guidelines as well. The main objective, so the first part of the study is to describe issues related to nutrition and quality of life during diagnosis and treatment amongst patients. So we're looking at malnutrition prevalence, looking at the prevalence of vitamin deficiencies. So patients are being tested for um, most of the vitamins I talked about. So niacin, iron, B12, folate, um, vitamin A, E, D and K. We're looking at symptoms, how often they exist, if they're nutrition related, um, if someone's got presence of anxiety or depression, any financial burden. Um, we're doing interviews with patients as well to sort of hear about their experience and any changes to their diet and if they've had contact with a dietitian. And then the second part of the research, we're aiming to describe the knowledge of health professionals in regards to nutrition. So the first part's looking at patients and what their experience is, and the second part is um, what knowledge and practices do health professionals currently have in nutrition. So let's describe what people are doing currently. Are there consistencies, are there inconsistencies in how health, health professionals are actually managing nutrition in nets? Um, and if we can summarise some international practice, that might lead us to developing some guidelines as well. So the first goal, which is the patient-based study, um, is what we call a prospective longitudinal study. So we're collecting data from patients over a period of time at regular time points. Um, so patients that are newly referred to Peter Mac and Austin with a gastrointestinal net, and the data collection for each patient is over six months. Second phase, which is the health professional phase, so we've sent out an online survey to health professionals internationally, so in several countries, um, for them to fill in a questionnaire about what they know about nutrition, any nutrition issues that they've seen exist amongst their net patients that they've seen, and then doing focus groups with the clinicians at Peter Mac. So in terms of where the research is up to at the moment, so recruitment's ended and we've got about 60 patients on the study. Um, over half of those have finished their follow-up. So we've got a lot of data already ready to analyse and there's been 11 interviews done at baseline and then about half of those have done their six month follow-up. So the average age was about 60 and a little bit more than half were male. We have commenced data analysis, but I've only got a kind of little brief snippet to show you the um, general demographics, so what type of patients were involved in this study. And as you can see, it varies quite a lot, which is really common for all sorts of research done in nets. So most of the patients involved in the study had either small intestine or pancreatic nets, um, and then there were a few that had a colon net. Um, quite a mix of grading, um, and not everybody may know their grade and some were unknown, but um, probably most were grade two nets. And in terms of treatment, because some patients that were referred to Peter Mac had been treated elsewhere and then referred to us for a specialist um, consultation, so they've had some ADSAT analogs before, some had had surgery, some had had chemo, but about 40% hadn't had any treatment. Is there separating between those who've got the syndrome and those who haven't? Um, we haven't got that data yet. We've got, we've got data on symptom prevalence, so we'd be able to pick up um, patients that have carcinoma syndrome and those that don't. Um, but we haven't fully analysed the symptom data yet. Um, I thought what might be most interesting to all of you was some of the dietary data. So around 30% were assessed as malnourished, so that's using a validated malnutrition tool that I performed with patients, but over half reported changing their diet. So there's quite a significant proportion of this very varied group of net patients that are making changes to their diet, and a lot of these changes were patient initiated, they weren't health professional initiated, so people are taking it upon themselves to change their diet, think about what they're eating and modifying things. Um, and I've listed some of the more common um, foods <coughs> or drinks that are avoided or reduced um, and some sort of change in meal patterns as well, which as a dietitian I would highlight as a potential risk factor in terms of if someone's doing this without guidance from a health professional, you want to make sure they're not restricting their diet unnecessarily. But I think, um, you know, eating smaller meals, avoiding, you know, 50% were avoiding certain foods and, you know, things like fatty foods and spicy foods were common ones that people reported as well. Um, and I think this gives us a really nice picture of, you know, there is existence of people changing their diet. It is an important issue to people. A lot of people in the interviews reported that, you know, nutrition for them, they had so many questions about it, but they didn't know who to ask, particularly those that had been assessed at a hospital before they came to Peter Mac. Um, 
and that they felt like they got misinformed about a lot of the dietary information. So that's really good for us to know and for us to be able to help patients down the track. So in terms of the health professional um, progress, so the online survey was released over a period of six months and we got over 70 responses from around the world, um, which I guess that finished up in about June. So quite a mix of medical staff and that includes um, oncologists, surgeons, radiation oncologists, nuclear medicine physicians, um, nursing staff and dietitians. I've got a little picture of where these responses came from. So most of them from Australia, some from the UK, um, less from New Zealand, Europe and US. Um, and our focus groups, we've got a total of 13 um, clinicians to do the focus groups at Peter Mac and that was a combination of our doctors, nurses and dietitians, which is following on from the online survey results. Um, so I've almost completed analysing the survey results and that'll be ready for publication pretty soon. Um, I will be presenting at AppNets in November, isn't it? Yeah, so I should have a little bit more results by then if anyone's thinking of coming along to AppNets. Um, hopefully I can present some of the survey results as well there um, if people are interested. Because essentially what the survey was asking health professionals was um, what are the common symptoms that patients report to you? Is diet an important concern for patients? Um, how do you manage diet? Do you screen for vitamin deficiencies? If so, which ones? and why, if you're not screening, what are your barriers to doing that? So it's giving us really rich information about their practices um, and why they're doing things and why they're not doing things, um, which will enable us to not only educate health professionals, but also you know, decide what best practice should be. So I've just got a few bits of information. The Nutrition Nets booklet, which there's some sitting behind me here from the New Home Foundation is really great. Um, and there's a few websites, so the DAA website, which is the Dietitians Association of Australia, um, is a good resource for finding accredited practicing dietitians. There's not many that specialise in NETS, and I'm happy to be a contact for people if you need more information, but there are dietitians working privately um, with gastrointestinal experience that are helpful. The Royal Free Hospital in the UK has got a useful food and NETS booklet, um, that's the third link. That's very, very extensive and gives lots of really good information about different treatments and different nutrition impacts. Um, and Cancer Research UK has a few links as well. And that's it. Happy to discuss and take any questions. Question about um, BMI. Um, someone got an S, a BMI of under 18. Is, but that's the normal style. Is that something to be concerned about? So the person's normally underweight? Yeah. I guess in terms of body weight, it's okay to be in the underweight range if that's sort of your normal. I guess it depends how underweight. I mean, if, if the BMI range is 20 to 25 and you're sitting at 17 or 18, that's probably not too bad if, if you're normally very thin. But if your BMI is 13, 14, that's of absolute concern. And a half yeah. Yeah. Look, that's fine. I think you've got to think about what someone's normal is as well because there are people that are naturally thin. There are people that are naturally larger so I think you take that into account and it's more that weight stability over time that we look at as well so if you're someone who was BMI of 21 but over six months you then a BMI of 17 that's the concern because of the change not so much um, you know if you start that way. Yeah. Well, do, you, do you see a place for juicing like you know people often recommend carrot juices and green juices, fresh juices made up of particular veggies and stuff like that. Do you see that as part of the next diet? Um, yeah, look, in terms of the healthy diet, absolutely. Um, the good things about juicing is that it's a really easy way to get in lots of fruits and veggies. So if you're someone who, I mean, getting in five serves of vegetables, two serves of fruit a day, most people find hard, even I do. So it's a good way to get that in. What you're not getting from juicing through fruit and veg is fibre. So a lot of the fibre gets broke down in the juicing process, but that's okay as long as you're getting fibre from other sources in your diet. Um, so you get a lot of rich nutrients. You do still get some fibre um, and it's a fairly healthy thing to do. The more veggies you put in juice, the better because then it's lower in calories. So if you're not wanting to have too much caloric intake, it's better not to pack it up with fruit because fruit's naturally got a lot of sugar in it, which is totally fine to have, but high calorie if you have a lot of it. Um, so it's safe to have, the only time I tell patients not to juice a lot is ones that are on chemo um, and other um, treatments that compromise their immune system because juicing can be really high in antioxidants, which is fine if you're not on treatment. 
but if you're on certain treatments or taking certain drugs, it can impact the drug interaction. Erin, one that comes up for me on the phone all the time is, should I stop eating sugar? Yep, that's a good one. Um, get asked that a lot as well, as to most of the dietitians at Peter Mac. Um, the general answer is no, there's not a whole lot to be concerned about. Um, I think where most of the worry comes from is a couple of reasons. Some of the concern comes from PET scans. So people knowing that when you have a PET scan, you get infused with a glucose solution that lights up your cancer cells um, on the scan that are rapidly growing. The reason it does that is because it's a rapidly growing cell. So it's using energy really rapidly. Um, and if you're infusing it with glucose, it's gonna suck that up straight away. It doesn't necessarily mean the glucose is causing the tumor to grow. Um, the other place it's probably coming from is some research that's being done in sort of very basic lab models and mouse models, looking at tumour cells and how they actually use energy and if we can actually look at certain treatments, certain biological therapies that are actually impacting the way that a cancer cell uses energy and takes that. And if we cut that off, will that actually cause the cancer cell to stop growing or to die? I guess the key with that is that, that that's not necessarily looking at sugar specifically, it's looking at the actual channels of uptaking energy in the cells. The body will try to maintain a homeostasis so it's normal level as best as it can essentially. So if you cut out all the carbohydrates and sugars that you ate in your diet, your body has fats and it has proteins that it can easily break down and use for energy as well. So if you stopped eating sugar, your body's cells, including tumour cells, are still going to use energy from some sources and that would potentially be breaking down your fat stores and your muscle stores to do so. So whilst eating a high sugar diet is not healthy for you, and I advise against that, don't feel like you need to cut it out because there's no scientific reason that we know of at this stage and no research to say that it's unsafe for cancer. Similar question, just the yeah, so very popular at the moment. We've actually had a few questions up recently. Um, ketogenic diet, I guess the reason behind it is you're cutting out carbohydrate and you're changing your metabolic function to preference fats is what it's burning for energy. In the short term, it can be okay and safe, but it's not a diet that we suggest people to take, particularly long term. Um, there's vital organs such as your brain and your heart that actually prefer glucose for energy, so energy that comes from carbohydrate, um, and those will not function as well and you potentially get other byproducts and side effects over time if you're not taking in any glucose or carbohydrate. Um, if you want to follow a ketogenic diet and you're adamant about it, I just suggest having a dietitian follow you quite regularly or a doctor um, for that. Yeah, But in terms of assisting with cancer or slowing tumour growth, there's no evidence for that in terms of a ketogenic diet at the moment. Erin, people are talking to their doctor about Creon, so particularly if they're on a metastatin analog injection and feeling like they might have symptoms of steatorrhea, and they talk to their doctor about Creon, um, and their doctor says, never heard of it, don't know what to do with it. What do you suggest? Yeah, and look, some GPs may not know a whole lot about Creon. That's quite common. So that's the thing that comes up for our rural yeah. people. Yeah. I think our rural patients might be watching this on video, so I'm doing a Dorothy <laughs> thing for the purpose of the people who might be watching at home later. Yeah, um, it's interesting because I guess as a, as a dietitian, I actually find that I direct um, Creon usage and get doctors to write scripts that I've suggested for patients a lot. Um, so we, uh, we help prescribe it, even though we can't officially sign a prescription. Um, we don't have prescribing rights. Um, so there are other health professionals that may have the information if that specific doctor doesn't, but I realise it's difficult in a rural scenario um, where you're limited to, you know, your key GP. Um, but what I would potentially do is if, I mean, there's, there's sites, I'm trying to think if I can circulate some information. There would be like a website you could go to with some information about Creon that I'm sure you'd be able to show your doctor if they're not sure about it. But a specialist, so an oncologist or a gastroenterologist, Gastroenterologists particularly, I think, which are a very important profession in NETS, um, would know about Creon. So if, if you're getting symptoms and you're getting ongoing diarrhoea, 
Um, if you're on somatostatin analogs, you should be probably seeing an oncologist anyway. Um, they should know a bit more about Creon than your GP, um, so try a specialist. But otherwise, dietitians should know as well. So even asking for a referral to a dietitian to sort of help educate about it might be helpful. Yep. Yep. So we might put some links on the YouTube Yeah, there so would be. We've got written resources that we give to patients about it, so that might be a good thing okay. Yeah, to have a look at. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah, and look, in some people it's completely life-changing because I've seen mm. people that have got significant diarrhoea, they lose mm. so much weight because mm. you're losing all this energy through the fat mm. that you're passing. Um, and it's as simple as if they start creon and that's, that was, you know, what all they needed, they immediately stabilised their weight, um, they feel so much better, um, yeah, and, and all the risks are sort of gone, so... And the dose can take some tweaking to kind Yeah, of absolutely. Because I, I, yeah. sometimes I talk to people who say, well, I started it and it didn't make any mm. difference. It depends, so. yeah, it depends what you start on. Traditionally, there's a starting dose. Um, and then uh, the way that I normally work dosing is I see how someone feels. So you start a dose with someone, symptomatically see how they feel. If your symptoms haven't improved, we up the dose again. The dose is based primarily on what you're eating. So uh, we take a diet history and see what fat containing foods that you've got in your diet and sort of tell you roughly how much to take depending on what you're eating. If you're eating fat containing snacks, we'd suggest you have it then too. Um, so it is a bit of trial and error, I suppose. So it may take up to a month or so to actually get the right dose, which would mean sort of coming back regularly to review your symptoms and your dosing with who you see or sort of phone consults on that. Um, we normally might start someone on two tablets at a meal. If that's not enough, we'll go up to three or four. I've had some people on six to seven tablets at a meal that have severe steatorrhea. So it just depends on what works for you. But also there might be people that have diarrhoea they try Creon and it doesn't help because that's not actually the cause of your diarrhoea. So also worth keeping that in mind and that's why talking to a doctor about the causes is important. Yeah. Questions? Well look, thank you so much Erin. It's <coughs> really, really kind <coughs> and generous of you to share your knowledge and it's great to get that little snapshot glimpse of of the start of your research findings. I know um, there's lots of people all over the world who are just hanging out to, to mm -hmm. find out the full story of what you discover in that project. So congratulations on, on the work that you've done so far on that. I know Thank it's you. just looking at the things that you've been doing, an incredible amount of work. So Yeah, and so almost there. Yeah, Hopefully you're by amazing. the end of the year so we'll have most of the results. Yeah. We'll see how we go. So yeah. thank you, you've been incredibly generous. And I, I should also say that Erin's um, one of the major contributors to the Nutrition and Nets booklet that we produce and also the Food and Symptom Diary that's on our website. And so Erin's been so generous behind the scenes too. So we thank you so much. Yeah, happy to help. Um, we've just got a tiny little gift for you oh, to drink you. your Yakult in. Oh, lovely. And, um, <laughs> thank you. You probably won't want to fill it completely with you cook, but, <laughs> but yeah, thank you. And I'll, I'll get you to join me in thanking Mary.